Tilt to Kilt knew about Sydney and Heather's relationship. It wasn't a secret. At least to any of us, it wasn't. So in the weeks before Heather Elvis goes missing, she puts on noticeable weight. The uniform is a bra, a shrug, and a skirt. So there's three separate pieces that you can move up in sizes. She went from an A cup bra to a B cup bra, then a B to a C, and then the skirt went from a medium skirt to a large skirt. Heather had taken a pregnancy test while at work. I want to say it was the beginning of November, and she wasn't sleeping with anyone else other than Sydney. When she took the test, it came up error. I didn't really know if she was pregnant or not. I think it was kind of up in the air. If she's pregnant and it's Sydney's child, that certainly throws a new wrinkle into this story. I think it was, in the beginning, hard to imagine that two people like Tammy Moore and Sydney Moore would take the life of a young girl. So you felt like there had to be something more and we believed that it was because Tammy Moore thought she was pregnant. So initially, when the Moors were arrested, they were charged with murder in addition to kidnapping. Kidnapping in South Carolina means to decoy, inveigle, or take another individual. So even the phone call from the payphone that Sydney made to decoy her out was kidnapping. That murder charge was later dropped, I assume given the lack of physical evidence in this case. No body, no blood, no murder weapon, that it would have been hard to prove for the state. The trial of the man accused of kidnapping Heather Elvis is now underway. I sat in that room and I thought that by the end of the week, if things went the way that we wanted them to, it would be like this release. Thank you, Your Honor. This time, the state calls Jessica Cook. One of the first witnesses we actually called to the stand was Jessica Cook. Jessica was one of the managers at the Tilted Kilt where Heather worked. Do you ever notice any changes in her physical appearance? Yes. Remember that video of Sydney at the Walmart the night of Heather's disappearance? Prosecutors think they know why he was there. On that video, it shows uh, Sydney Moore in his truck. F-150 drive into a handicapped parking spot, exit his vehicle, walk into the Walmart. The receipt showed that he had purchased a pregnancy test and uh, a cigar type cigarette, and he paid cash. The conjecture is that they're gonna take it to Heather and make her take a pregnancy test. I think that if she was pregnant, I think that would be another reason why Tammy would want Heather out of the picture. According to Sydney, the reason he went to that Walmart was to buy a pregnancy test for his wife, Tammy. He insisted that they were trying to have another baby. There was no hard evidence of guilt to me. There was a bunch of bad character evidence, and there was a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence. Now, tell this story about how old you are. Prosecutors built what they believed was a very convincing case, knowing that asking a jury to convict based solely on circumstantial evidence is always a steep hill to climb. I think the surveillance footage was absolutely key, and that goes from the Walmart to the payphone to the truck going down and coming back, because it created a timeline that showed everything, all attention was on Tammy Moore and Sydney Moore, and everything they did was very deliberate towards Heather Elvis. Good question, John. Very well, thank you. When the state rested, I felt pretty good about it. If the jury required proof beyond a reasonable doubt, we were in good shape. So we did not put up a defense at that point. The whole thing is traumatizing. The most traumatizing thing about all this is not knowing where our child is. Everybody was just kind of waiting. I think most people thought it'd be several hours for a verdict. We're like, this is a slam dunk. But it wasn't. The jury is still deadlocked and will be unable to resolve it. Therefore, I'll declare a mistrial. And this case will have to be tried again. To say that I was shocked that Sidney Moore got off on a hung jury would be putting it mildly. I think all of us were wondering, what now? What do we do from here? 
The hung jury was a painful blow to the prosecutors and the Elvis family, and prosecutors were convinced that Tammy and Sidney were responsible. But getting answers about what happened to Heather remained the priority. Investigators felt sure that the Moors knew more than they were telling, and they thought that maybe if they pressured them hard enough, long enough, one of them would begin cooperating with authorities. Sidney Moore then is charged with obstruction of justice for lying to police during the investigation. It's over the payphone call where he's on video denying it, and then, yeah, we all know he made that phone call. I know that Sidney Moore misled the police from the very get-go, and we felt like this is a missing girl, and the first 48 hours are so important, so that's why we decided to move forward with the trial. It only took the jury 50 minutes to decide. On the charge of obstruction of justice, guilty. He's found guilty of obstruction of justice and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The Elvis family says today's verdict is the beginning, not the end. I think it'll be like dominoes. I think the first one fell. I think the rest will fall into place. Um, you can't hide it forever. While prosecutors fell short in their bid for a guilty verdict in Sydney's trial, they learned an important lesson. They needed more evidence. With Tammy's trial on the horizon, prosecutors felt very confident that a conviction in that case would bode very well for the retrial of Sydney. If getting answers about Heather was paramount, investigators understood that first, they had to figure out who the mastermind was. If I had to pick a ringleader, it was definitely Tammy Moore. She had the motive. He had the means and opportunity. If it wasn't for Tammy Moore, Heather Elvis would be here. It's not often that a defendant in a felony case sits down to tell their side of the story without an attorney present on the night before they're expected to testify. Not to mention violating a gag order on them, but that's exactly what happened. Put it out uh, dead center. Got right there, Scott. As you probably expect, we're gonna go through a lot of stuff, right? I'm also going to ask you tough questions, which I'm sure you're bracing yourself for. I haven't no. braced at all. When a family member or a friend goes missing, it's like a part of you goes missing with them. Well, it's been nearly five years since Heather Elvis disappeared. Today, the trial for one of the suspects, Tammy Moore, started. And you knew there was a price to pay. In October 2018, Tammy Moore went to trial for conspiracy to kidnap Heather Elvis and kidnapping Heather Elvis. We are here because she can't be. And she can't be here because she decided she can't be here. Prosecutors have never before made a clear link between Elvis and Tammy Moore, and her attorney says there is no link that can be made. Because Tammy Moore didn't kidnap anyone. She didn't conspire to kidnap anyone. Tammy Moore's case was definitely more difficult than Sydney's case. We didn't have her on video at Walmart. We didn't have her making a payphone call. Even that evidence hadn't been enough to convict Sydney. So for Tammy's trial, prosecutors realized they had to essentially redo their presentation of the case. I knew we could do better. When you collect evidence, police normally focus on that very tight time that she goes missing at. But we started looking at a much larger time frame. Prosecutors tracked Sydney and Tammy's movements all over town before, during, and after Heather's disappearance. And what they found was damning. After Tammy found out about this affair, they literally stalked Heather Ellis. They were chasing her, basically watching her to find out when she may be the most vulnerable. And based on this analysis, prosecutors were able to secure a second indictment for conspiracy to kidnap on top of the kidnapping charges they already had. We really decided we are showing these jurors everything we've got. And this time, the state calls Jody Davenport. The key witnesses really were those individuals that knew that she was dating Sydney Moore, and at the time, she thought she was pregnant. Do you know who she was having sex with? Sydney. Who was she scared of? Tammy. I had never been face-to-face -face with Tammy. 
up until that point. Who's in this picture? That's Heather. You know, I'm giving my testimony and I'm speaking and being questioned. And how did she feel about Sydney? She loved him. And she's staring into my eyes and she she has this way of being very, very intimidating. I, I mean, I get goosebumps still thinking about it to this day. Tammy Moore was an extremely dominant, controlling person. She takes his phone. He can't work at the Tilted Kilt any longer. She even chains him to the bed at night. I'm not speaking figuratively to you right now. Literally chains him to the bed at night. The prosecution also alleges that Tammy forced Sidney to get a tattoo of her name on his body. And the state calls Jacob Melton. And they brought to the stand a friend of their son's to testify about what he heard Tammy tell Sydney. If you were to have mess with that girl, this wouldn't have been happening. And she was referring to what, the tattoo? Yes. Okay, and where was it located on Sydney? On his lower front waist. While the defense didn't deny the existence of the tattoo, they insisted that Sydney had gotten it long before he had met Heather. In fact, they presented photos of the tattoo in process during trial. The whole idea behind the tattoos and the handcuffing is to show Tammy's control over Sydney. The whole prosecution theory is that she grew so jealous over Heather that the two of them conspired to kidnap her. Eventually, Heather and her friends come to the realization she might be pregnant. When this gets out and becomes common knowledge, the fire, the jealousy, that is in Tammy Moore explodes into utter rage. This is where the plan starts. This is where the conspiracy is born. But while there seemed to be plenty of motive, what the case lacked was the kind of direct evidence that juries often rely on. Testimony and evidence will show that Tammy and the missing woman were never together. Everything we had was circumstantial. But the circumstantial evidence we had, I don't think, could be contradicted. It's time to stay across Mike Nelson to the stand. We provide the software that analyzes cell phone records during investigations. We were able to visually show the jury where they were based on the phone records. So we can see how the phone uses different towers over time. So you use it basically to show the phone's movement? Yes, ma'am. Tammy and Sydney, both of their phones began following around Heather Elvis's phone after November 2nd. So that places Heather's phone up there that evening. Also on that same evening that we have Tammy's phone on the Sprint network. And now also Sydney Moore fitting that in. Sydney Moore's phone is up there as well, yes. And on the night of December 18th, both Sydney and Tammy's cell phone pinged on the same tower near the payphone, proving they were together that night. And it's Tammy and Sydney's phone in the area of this payphone at 1 30. Yes, they are. Immediately after that phone call, she calls her roommate. My exact words were do not call Sydney back, don't do anything rash, go to sleep, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. When is the next time that you heard from her? I haven't. In a week like this, it's almost like you're just drowning. So when you have moments like that, you have to reach out and hold on to other people because it's hard. Um, the world kind of swallows you up. When prosecutors presented video surveillance footage showing that Ford F-150 driving back and forth from Peachtree Landing just before and just after Heather disappears, they were actually able to call a person who teaches forensic video analysis at Quantico. The work that we do includes the help with questions of primarily of identification. He looked at the Morris truck and looked at the video, analyzed all sorts of headlights, testified about different types of trucks and the way their headlights work. Is it your opinion today, after looking at everything you've looked at, that indeed it was the same truck as the known truck, which belonged to Tammy Moore? Yes. When the state rested, they excused the jury. It was pretty clear Tammy wanted to say something. She is 
so narcissistic, I don't think she could help it. All right, and do you wish to testify in this case? I do not. When she said, yes, I want to testify, there was a gasp in the room. There's no doubt Tammy Moore thought I can convince this jury that I've done nothing wrong. So help me God. Thank you. Please be seated. These were Facebook posts, triple coupons, follow, school's all done. So it looks like you are putting together a timeline. It starts with early in the night at 1.47, my sister texts me. 3.10, I pull into the driveway. I text her, I got the ad, and then I'm home. 3.58, I make another post, and this is conversations that me and Sydney had that night. So I just, I wanna make sure that everything that I did was accounted for, that it's looking normal, just like any other day in my life. I was surprised when Tammy Moore decided to sit down with me for an interview in violation of a court-imposed gag order on her the night before she was expected to take the stand in her own defense and without her attorney present. What we got accused of, neither one of us would ever do. Which part? The kidnapping. And at first, it was murder as well. And that's not, we're not those kind of people. I've never even had a speeding ticket. I didn't even have sex till I was 18 years old. There are people who say that you were the pants in the family, that you were really the powerhouse here. The so man that makes the money is the one that's running the house. I paid the bills. And the wife who gets her name tattooed on her husband's stomach, that was right his above idea. the belt, that was his seems idea. to be the one who makes the rules. But that's making it sound like he got a tattoo because so I forced him to and I didn't. OK, so since we're on that <laughs> subject, after he had the affair with Heather, did you actually handcuff him to never, the bed? Never. It sounds like you're trying to hide or cover up something that seems completely natural, which is anger resulting from your husband cheating on you. I'm not mad at you. her. I am pissed at him because he's not being honest with me. Yet the prosecution essentially alleged in the beginning that you were angry enough that your husband cheated on you, that you were ready to kill. That's what they say, and they're wrong. Were you angry enough that your husband cheated on you that you were ready to kidnap? Absolutely not. It seems that the prosecution to some degree thinks that you are the linchpin here, not Sydney. They change it according to what they need to say. It seems like everybody is lying here, except you. And Lord. that's why I am terrified of tomorrow, because I feel like this town is going to crucify me because of all the lies and all of the that's happened. What happened to Heather Elvis? Well, after more than a week, the state has rested its case. Today, Tammy Moore took the stand in her own defense. You're right at this time, the defense calls uh, Tammy Moore. Please raise your right hand. There's no doubt Tammy Moore, when she took the stand, thought, I'm going to be running this courtroom while I'm up here. So help you, God. So help me, God. I had never heard her voice in person before. Did you learn? who he was having an affair with. Not until the girl called me back and told me who she was. I had no idea. So the messages were never directed towards Heather Ellis. Every time that woman used my daughter's name, it was like stabbing me with an ice pick. And did you feel like you had the right to know who it was? I did. I didn't go about it the right way, and I'm sorry for that. It looks bad, but I just wanted to know who it was. That's all. Uh, you've been known to use some pretty salty language, haven't you? Right. She sat there and smiled the entire time. She batted her eyelashes, and it just seemed like she was an actress putting on a play. Tammy thinks, in my opinion, that no matter where she's at, she's the smartest person in the room. You know what time 0800 is? 8 o'clock a.m. You had to worry, was the jury really going to buy this? Did you kidnap Heather Ellis? No, I did not. Do you know who kidnapped her? I do not. Do you know if she's been kidnapped? I do not. When Tammy first took the stand, she came across very credible. But I think we, through the evidence, already knew that there was a different side of Tammy Moore. Almost immediately, 
it got contentious between Nancy Lysay and Tammy Moore. Ms. Moore, do you know who I am? I do. Okay, and who am I? Nancy Lysay, you've made my life miserable. She came off the cuff and was saying it had ruined her life. So I knew for her, it was very personal. I think she was the next day she called. It was a nice conversation. She was a nice girl. She wasn't mean to me. I wasn't mean to her. It took very little to push her buttons. And you said on 11 11, I think the bitch is in high. Isn't that what you said? It's on there. Okay. Then what makes you think the bitch is in high? I was just being a jerk at the time, I guess, Nancy. That's all I can say. Have we ever met outside of this courtroom? I don't think so. Okay. Just didn't know when we got on a first name basis. That had to be the first defendant that had called me by my first name. I felt like that was a almost power play on her part. Me and you are equal, and I'm going to be controlling the temperament of these questions and answers. Ms. Moore, would you agree that the testimony has been that the truck went down there on 814 and Bill Pine? A truck, not my truck. But have you been in here for the testimony of the time of the videos? People lie, Nancy. I think Tammy Moore is filled with such anger, rage, and arrogance that she couldn't help herself. Tammy's text and social media posts could account for every single minute except for what seemed to be most critical, the time around 3.41 a.m. when Heather's cell phone went off the grid. Is there anything you have called on your phone, texted on your phone, or posted on Facebook at 3.35? I, I don't think so. Okay. How about at 3.40? Um, there's, I don't think so. How about 3.45? I don't know. She ain't on the phone at 3.35 or 3.40 or 3.50 or 3.55. She can't be. The only documentation you have shows before the truck goes down and after the truck comes back. Correct. If that's what you're saying to people, I don't, I don't know what time a truck went there. The one person <coughs> in this room that knows what happened to Heather Elvis already told you from the stand. She said Heather was a nice girl. She already knows something that I don't know that this family is uncertain about. I'm asking the 12 of you to look at the evidence and give this young woman and this family the ending that they deserve. It was such a contentious trial, I didn't know what the jury was going to do. The jury was out a very short amount of time. Prosecutors feel like that's never good for us. If you watched online for the past two weeks as the state laid out its case against Tammy Moore. Today, the jury returned a verdict. I think the moments leading up to the verdict probably took five years off my life. I feel like it was very stressful. Deliberations lasted for four hours. But when we found out that we had a verdict, um, anxiety, I was nervous. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a secretary of the verdict. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I just, uh, just closed my eyes and kept them closed. I was, I was almost afraid to open them. We, the jury, find the defendant, Tammy Case and Moore, guilty of conspiracy kidnapping. There you see it, Tammy Moore hugging her family minutes before the judge sentenced her to 30 years in prison. Shortly after, officers escorted her to J. Rubin Long Detention Center. I felt so relieved, but I just felt like it wasn't enough because the way that Tammy has this smile and this look on her face made me realize that I don't think she will ever say what she did to Heather that night. They've shown no remorse. They won't, they won't tell us anything we want to know. Uh, it's always somebody else's fault. 
Even though Tammy Moore's trial is over, the Elvis family have to still go through the trial of Sidney Moore. The retrial there is still pending, so, you know, we, we've got to wrap our heads around that. After Tammy was convicted in October of 2018, we retried Sydney in September of 2019 for the same thing. We can't give justice to Heather Elvis by giving an injustice to another citizen like Sydney Moore. We're going to show you that this man right here, Sydney Moore, and his wife Tammy Moore conspired, planned, and executed that plan to kidnap Heather Elvis on December 18th of 2013. You can't abduct somebody, you can't do all the things they're saying they're doing and not leave some trace of physical evidence. I had to make sure the jury understood that circumstantial evidence was just as effective, just as telling as a confession would be. The defense very well may dwell on the fact that this is a circumstantial kind of case. Most cases in criminal law, ladies and gentlemen of this jury, are circumstantial evidence. I think there were a lot of uh, pieces of evidence that pointed to the direction of the Moors, but for me, the defining moment in this case was the testimony of Donald D. Marino. From the evidence you're about to give the court in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide. Thank you. Donald D. Marino is Tammy Moore's cousin, and he is a convicted criminal with a rap sheet. But he said back in 2014, Sydney showed him a very disturbing photo. Did he show you anything? Yeah. Tell this jury who that picture was of. I had Elvis. He told us he had seen a picture of Heather Elvis on the phone. She was clearly not alive, and there was blood on her shirt and scratches on her face. In that picture, did Heather look like she was under her own free will? No. At that time, the judge would not have allowed us to get into the details of the photo because we were only trying them for kidnapping and not murder. Let me ask you this, after seeing that picture of Heather back in 2014, do you expect this family to ever hear from her again? No. Donald D. Marino, frankly, didn't have to testify. He didn't have to tell anybody what he saw. Tammy Moore was his cousin, and the last thing he wanted to do was go against family. Still, it was damaging testimony, despite the fact that uh, he couldn't produce the photograph. The question is, would anybody believe him? And the defense team was going to make sure the jury knew about his criminal past. What have you been convicted of in the past, sir? I got a Beverly charge and a public drug charge. I got a Beverly charge and a public drug charge. The drug is heroin. He's an addict. You can call him a thief if you want to. One thing he's not is a liar. <sighs> Prosecutors confirmed there were no deals cut with Di Marino for his testimony, and it's impossible to know whether the jury believed him. And that's when prosecutors dropped the bombshell that nobody saw coming. There was a video presented during Sydney's kidnapping trial that none of us had seen before. Holy crap, this is it. This is the evidence that anybody that still had doubts needed to say, wow, they did this. All testimony is now underway and the retrial of Sidney Moore. Both sides are trying to make their mark on the jury that could close a six-year investigation. In September 2019, after a hung jury and a conviction for obstruction of justice, Sidney Moore thought that he might have a chance. But prosecutors had some surprises in store. Sydney and Tammy Moore had had a home surveillance camera system in their house, which they tore out on the 20th and reinstalled a new one on the 21st. Now, remember, Heather disappeared early in the morning of December 18th, and anything that would have appeared on the old surveillance system wasn't there anymore. But investigators confiscated this new system anyway. Once the police finally got their surveillance footage, they saw Sydney was washing the car and vacuuming the car out on December 22nd. This DVD is a copy of the video surveillance system that was in the Mora's house. And what that security camera video shows is Sydney and Tammy spending hours cleaning their F-150 pickup truck. 
and not just cleaning the truck, but focusing on the rear passenger side. Originally, we tried to use the video in the first trial, and we were denied. The judge felt like, look, a lot of people wash their truck. It's a new truck. That's not going to be enough to get you there. I think that's mere suspicion. Once we went back and looked more at the footage and closer at the footage is when we found, look, there's more to this. About 30 minutes into cleaning the truck, Sydney starts a burn pile over in the side yard and starts burning some of the rags that they're cleaning with and it continues throughout the whole time they're there. So that kind of pushed it forward, and at that time, the judge allowed us to play it and put it into evidence. OK. Once the rags were burned, could you have gotten any evidentiary back? No, they were destroyed in the burn pile. Like, to me, that just screams guilty. The defense claimed that burning the trash is common in the Moore's neighborhood. Honestly, after we saw what was on the tape, we would have never dreamed they would have done that, knowing that that video surveillance camera was there. That was kind of, I felt like, the biggest mistake they had made. That wasn't the only piece of new evidence the prosecutors put forward. Other than Donald D. Marino's testimony, um, I think one of the big moments of this trial was when Ashley Kaysen took the stand, who is Tammy Moore's sister. Tammy's sister, Ashley, was called by the defense to testify on Tammy's behalf. But who would she play better for, the defense or the prosecution? The prosecutors asked Ashley about video that they claimed showed Tammy looking for police listening devices. You were looking for bugs, weren't you? You and your sister, Tammy? We're looking through, yeah, to see if the police had left any, I'm assuming, devices. Y'all were looking all through the tree. No, I don't recall. Okay, I can play this video and it can refresh your memory. You want me to refresh your memory? Sure. <laughs> That's what we're following. Okay. You literally could see Tammy Moore with a mirror looking under items in the house and in the yard trying to find out if the police had put anything there. It looks to me like she's pulling weeds up or okay, keep looking. what she did on the line. Keep looking. Okay, did you look like a mirror? I can't tell, to be honest. It's too far, either it's too far away or the picture's not good enough. The thing she said, you couldn't reconcile it with the evidence. Still, despite Ashley's testimony, prosecutors argued that Tammy's actions on video were yet another piece of damning evidence against the Moors. Tammy Moore is a woman who's concerned about police surveillance because, number one, she hates losing control, and number two, she knows exactly what she did that night. She knows exactly where poor Heather Elvis is, and she doesn't want to get caught. I need additional witnesses, Mr. Hill. Your Honor, the state has nothing further. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this proved the evidentiary portion of the case. Thank you. 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 Thank you trust the circumstances enough to say that we're uh, convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Like I told the jury in opening statements, this is absolutely a circumstantial evidence case for two reasons. One, Sydney and Tammy Moore are not cooperating. They don't have to. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But more than that, they lied, they misled police, they deleted records, they destroyed evidence. And I am here to ask you, at the end of this story, to give justice to this family and this community. These people have been patient and persistent. And I'm asking you to give them the ending to this story that Heather Elvis deserves. I'm asking you for justice. Thank you. It's been 2,093 days since Heather Elvis could wrap her arms around her father, Terry, could kiss her mother, Debbie, and tell her little sister, Morgan, that she loves her. After six years, multiple trials, three convictions, and a lot of heartache, the Elvis family braced themselves for the verdict. As for the prosecutors, Nancy Livesay and Chris Helms, all they could do was wait and hope. I understand the jury has reached the verdict. Yes. If you would pass the verdict, you'd be wrong. 
I was frankly more confident going into these deliberations than I was during Tammy's trial. I had confidence that these people would do the right thing. I think the mastermind is Tammy Moore, but I don't for one minute think that she is any more guilty than Sydney Moore. I think they were equal participants. The verdict came back after two hours of deliberation this time. Literally half the time they deliberated for Tammy's trial. I've asked the board please stand. You may publish the verdict. We, the jury, by unanimous consent, find the defendant, Sidney St. Clair Moore, on the charge of kidnapping, guilty. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Like Tammy, Sidney was also sentenced to 30 years on each charge to run concurrent. Do I feel he was wrongfully convicted? I mean, I feel the, I feel the jury got it wrong. Uh, not implying any necessarily any type of malfeasance or bad acts or anything of that nature, but you know I, I feel they did get it wrong. They tried to raise these reasonable doubt, and that was their job to raise reasonable doubt. But they didn't do their job because I wasn't doubting. Were you? No. I know the right people are behind bars. I have no doubt about that. The perfect solution would be to find Heather Elvis alive but I don't believe that'll ever happen. I think eventually one of them will turn. I think 30 years is a long time. I think once they find out that their appeals are denied, I think then they will be looking to tell the truth. After the verdict, I think the emotions that everyone felt were empty. There was no reprieve from the heaviness that's there because we don't know where Heather is. Yeah, for six years now, they've met at Peachtree Landing in Sacristy. This event brings other families who have lost loved ones or are missing loved ones during a time of year when family really means the most. If I could talk to Sydney, I would want to tell him that this has been just a really long nightmare for everybody. But he could make it better if he would tell the truth. So I'm hoping that Sydney sees this and he remembers what it's like to care for her. At some point, Sydney loved her or at least cared deeply for her. I hold out hope that I'll turn around one day at the front door and she'll walk in. Do I really think that'll happen? Deep down, no, I don't. But I'll never give up. I think that at 20 years old, you're looking for someone to love you. That somebody out there wants to love you unconditionally and walk away from everything in the world for you. I know how happy she would have been that somebody loved her and she had this fairy tale ending, but she didn't. She didn't have that fairy tale ending. Somebody stole that from her and they stole it from everybody else here too.